hurricanes and cyclones seem to be following me. I visited the east coast of the U.S. thinking I'd be far away from hurricanes. And for the first time in 50 years, they had a hurricane in Connecticut while I was there. It's trying to be in Connecticut for the first week of classes. Quite happy to see that you survived the hurricane much better than Connecticut did. Many people, when they travel, lose their luggage. Somehow I managed to lose my voice somewhere over the Atlantic. Uh, so <clears throat> if, my, if I'm not coming through loud enough, just politely raise your hand or something, and I will uh, turn up the volume a little bit. It's, uh, it's always a bit tricky knowing exactly what to say starting the, uh, the second week, because uh, I only have partial details of what was said before, so there might be a, a few redundancies. But uh, Professor Pizier was keeping me uh, posted on what he was doing in his lectures, so I'll try not to, uh, not to repeat things too much. So let me begin with a, uh, a, an overview of uh, what my planned lectures are, and hopefully you won't throw up your hands and say, but that's what they did last week. So, uh, uh, ah, here's the truck. So here's the, uh, here's the uh, preliminary outline. And, uh, so the first lecture I want to uh, just do a, a couple of fundamental matrix theory things, which I will be uh, using quite, quite often. It's just nice if we all uh, understand how elementary they are. Talking matrix theory in, in India is a bit like bringing coals to Newcastle, because this is really one of the, uh, with Bhatia here, this is really one of the best centers for, for matrix theory. But the, uh, the first part, I'm going to do some theorems of Choi. These uh, won't be the same theorems you saw from Pizier last time because, in fact, unfortunately, Choi never stated these as theorems. He just uh, makes them remarks in a couple of his papers. But if you understand the nature of these remarks, uh, it really simplifies uh, many things in quantum error correction. So that's, the, that's the, really the goal of the first lecture, is to show you these things that follow from Choi's work that uh, are really at the heart of what makes some things in quantum error correction work. So that will be, uh, that will be the second lecture. And uh, after that, we'll have started to get some sense of why uh, operator systems are very important in quantum. I know Professor Pizier focused mostly on operator spaces. So what I want to talk about is the, a little bit here of the abstract theory of matrix ordered spaces. So PZA talked a lot about matrix norms. I want to talk a little bit about matrix orders. These also showed up uh, and played a big role in the work of uh, Fahn, uh, Dr. Gela, and uh, Werner on finitely correlated states. So these ideas about matrix order are really starting to creep into uh, quantum things quite a bit. And from there, we'll talk about, among all matrix ordered spaces, what is it that's special about operator systems? So there's a, a theorem of Choi and Efros that uh, gives necessary and sufficient conditions for things to be operator systems. I'll introduce uh, what we mean by the dual of a matrix ordered space and uh, talk about something a little bit new and that's uh, <coughs> quotients of matrix ordered spaces. And in here I'll answer some questions about uh, basic questions about what if you start with a operator system that's just a, a subspace of matrices, what is its dual really? Uh, 
if you think of its ordered dual as opposed to its uh, normed dual. So we'll see that show up here. <clears throat> Lecture four will be about tensor products of operator systems. If you start with two operator systems and you form their vector space tensor product, it turns out, uh, just as with C-star algebras, there's many, many ways you could make that in to a new operator system that's somehow consistent with the two structures. The way that's most common for everyone uh, working in quantum is to just consider the spatial tensor product. Think of everything as living on a Hilbert space, tensor the two Hilbert spaces, and then view the operator systems as the operator system on that Hilbert space. But it turns out that uh, if you want to now study what is the dual of such a system, it's, uh, it turns out that uh, there's a relationship that if you do minimal tensors, when you dualize, it becomes maximal tensors. So even if you don't want to have to think about these other uh, possible uh, structures on tensor products of operator systems, it turns out to be very important if you want to understand what the dual of a tensor of two operator systems is, because spatial tensors go to maximal tensors. So we'll go through that theory. And uh, one very pretty application of it is we'll be able to give a very easy 10 or 15 minute proof of a famous theorem of Choi and Efros, which characterizes nuclear, opera nuclear C star algebras. It turns out uh, if you do the operator system proof instead of the C star algebra proof, it's much, much simpler. Then in the fifth lecture, I'll return to this uh, problem that uh, stumps everyone. That's this uh, Searleson conjecture, which you heard about last time, <coughs> which is equivalent to this famous Kahn embedding problem, and which is also equivalent to uh, a conjecture of Kirchberg. And, uh, the real goal of this pro talk, I'm of course not going to solve these uh, conjectures, but I'll be able to answer uh, what do operator systems <coughs> contribute to this discussion. And in particular, one, uh, one result I'll show is that there's a uh, uh, a 25-dimensional vector space with two operator system structures on it. And the Searleson problem is equivalent to deciding if these two operator system structures on just a 25-dimensional space are the same or not. So how hard can it be if it's only 25 dimensions, right? <laughs> Except, of course, those of you who know op about operator systems, there's really a whole level of matrix hierarchies you have to study. So it's not just at the ground level you have to worry, but uh, at the matrix levels. But it gives a, a very different and I think unique perspective on the, these problems. And so that'll be uh, the goal of the fifth lecture. This perspective really uses this calculus of tensor products, which is why I want to introduce it in uh, lecture four. So have all of these been done before? <laughs> yeah. So I found that uh, they showed <coughs> Searleson for two observers is equivalent to Kahn. There's a generalization if you ask for three, four, or five <coughs> observers, which is more general than Kahn. So, so maybe I should say two Searleson. Uh, the operator systems also tells you uh, what the three, four, five Searleson is about also. So for the three, it's a, a five cubed dimensional space. For the four, it's a five to the fourth dimensional space, and uh, so on. Uh, any other questions? OK. So let me begin just by establishing uh, a bit of notation uh, and uh, doing a couple of uh, 
fairly, uh, fairly well-known uh, matrix theory results, but things I'll use all the time. So uh, I'm not going to use uh, the physicist's notation too much. For me, that's still a bit like speaking in a foreign language. And uh, uh, you all are faster at translating than I am. So I'm going to uh, use matrix theory notation. Uh, I'll give you the dictionary for translating, and I'll let you do the translations uh, whenever. So when I think of vectors in CN, since I'm doing matrix theory, I, lo I love to multiply them by matrices. And for that, I always want to think of them as column vectors. So whenever I have a vector in CN, unless I tell you expi explicitly otherwise, I'll always be thinking of it as a column. And I'll use a uh, star for the adjoint instead of dagger, because the uh, dagger looks too much like my plus sign. So if I talk about V star, that means conjugate transpose. So another way to think of things here, when I say that I'm always thinking of CN as column vectors, that means I'm really thinking of them as n by 1 matrices, if you like. So when I do the adjoint, it's a 1 by n matrix. And of course, if I do V star times W, that's just the uh, inner product of V and W. And if I do W times V star, then I'm multiplying an n by 1 times a 1 by n. So that's an n by n. And it's the matrix uh, beta i alpha j bar, which is uh, the physicist's uh, VW. So since I'm thinking of, so here's, here's the dictionary. Since I'm thinking of column vectors, W is W. star is V. So uh, if you freely substitute uh, those two symbols, uh, you can easily translate my notation to, uh, to the math physics notation. OK, so far? OK. So the next thing, when I say that P is an element of MN plus, uh, so first off, MN means I'm speaking about uh, N by N matrices. And plus means I'm talking about positive semi-definite matrices. Now, of course, since P is positive semi-definite, um, <clears throat> but not necessarily positive definite. Let me let uh, U1 through UR be the. Uh, Excuse me, I think W is actually W. Now, when I do W times V star, see, it's an N by 1 times a 1 by N. So I'll have a beta I alpha J. Oh, 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 yes. Helps if I get things right. <laughs> ah. No, I had it. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. If you if you do my substitutions, uh, <laughs> has to be. That. Yes, yes. I'm I'm keeping to the physicists that way. The uh, inner product will be antilinear in the first variable. 
So s some concessions to physicists here. But uh, most physicists use a, uh, a, a dagger sign for the conjugate transpose. And like I said, I can't tell my daggers apart from my pluses. And I need to use pluses far more. Uh, OK, so um, if I take these uh, non-zero eigenvalues, so this means that r is the rank of p, and let's say p of ui is uh, little pi ui. The fact that it's positive semi-definite is just saying the uh, pi's are all non-zero. And if I let vi be the square root of pi ui, <coughs> then p is also the matrix uh, vi vi star. So that's, uh, that's what we often call, uh, when I want to do this, I'll refer to this as the spectral decomposition. Now, the spectral decomposition is always a very nice thing to talk about. But to do it, you, you have to have the eigenvalues. And in practice, in the real world, computing eigenvalues isn't all that easy. You can't find the roots of a polynomial if it's degree greater than 4. So, uh, so even though mathematicians always talk about the spectral decomposition, it's very rare if someone hands you a large matrix, you can actually do the spectral decomposition. So often what you have instead is you do something like uh, the Cholesky algorithm or some other algorithm. But there are lots and lots of ways that you can find to decompose a positive semi-definite matrix as a sum of rank 1 tensors. So the first, the first little issue I want to address, and believe it or not, this is really what's at the heart of quantum error correction, is what can you say about the vectors that show up in all these different decompositions? So suppose I have two totally different ways to write P as a sum of rank 1 tensors. What's, what's surprisingly, there is a relationship between the V's and the W's. So uh, those of you who know uh, much matrix theory have seen all these things before. But I'd like to show you my elementary way to see them, because these will be the little elements of our toolkit we'll want to use later when we're uh, looking at ways to write Choi representations of CP maps in different ways. So the two elements, so, sorry, so the question I want to uh, ask is, what is the relationship between the V's and W's? And, uh, this is a rhetorical question, because I'm going to give you the answer in just a moment. There's really two elements to the answer. And the, uh, the key way I like to see this is uh, to use something that operator theorists love, but I don't think too many other people use very often. And it's the famous Douglas factorization. So what this says, suppose you have two operators on, on Hilbert space. And suppose that B star B is smaller than A star A. Then what Douglas says is that in that case, B can be factored as uh, A times something. So it, the way he likes to look at this is this inequality implies that A divides B. So what does that mean exactly? Well, it means that uh, there exists a unique C which goes from the range of A to the range of B. It's a contraction 
and B factors as C times A. I'll give you a, a hint of the proof. Uh, doesn't look like much of a proof, does it? <laughs> but uh, what's, the, what's the real issue with that proof? Uh, the issue is, well, why should that be well defined? Right? We're trying to define C as a linear map. Uh, there was no insistence that A be one to one, so there could be lots of H's here that give you the same AH. But if they all give you the same AH, then they also all have to give you the same BH. That was Douglas's observation. And that follows from this inequality. Because basically, uh, to decide if they, it's enough to look at an H that's sent to zero by A, but if AH is zero, then A star A H and a product H is zero, which forces B star B H and a product H to be zero which tells you the length of BH is zero, which tells you BH is also zero. So the remarkable thing is that this is well defined. And then also the operator inequality tells you that the length of BH is shorter than the length of AH. So that's a contraction. So the way operator theorists like to think is we like to really think of this as a matrix multiplication. So back to the, uh, back to the first thing. Oh, so by the way, that's uh, all I'm going to say about the proof. Uh, the Halmos box means I'm done even if you're not happy. <laughs> so, so back to uh, this P, which is the sum of uh, VI, VI star. And uh, let me keep it the case that R is the rank of P. And then we have some other one. So suppose we just have one, not even necessarily the spectral, just one where the number of terms we use is the rank. <coughs> and another one. Well, what we'll do is we'll let V be the operator, or the matrix, whose columns are V1 through VR. Remember, I always like to think of them as columns. And then W So this V is a uh, N by R matrix, and this is an N by M matrix. Ho hopefully you can tell my N's and my M's apart uh, either when I write or when I say them. It's a so uh, if we think about what V does, it's a map from CR to CN. Because P is rank R, these vectors have to be linearly independent. So this is one to one. And of course, that means that V star is uh, onto. And if you look at what this equation says, it really says that P is V times V star. or W times W star. So therefore, by Douglas, uh, W star is some U times V star. Is this U going to go? U is going to go from the range of V star, which is all of CR, 
into the range of W star, which is some subspace of Cn. So in other words, U is a <coughs> n by R matrix. And the norm of U is less than 1. But in this case, we could use Douglas in either direction, because uh, what we actually have is an equality here. So there's also uh, a contraction C, so that uh, C times W star equals V star. Norm C is less than 1. Well, if you do C times U times V star, that's V star. But uh, since V star is onto, this C times U has to be the identity on the entire space. Well, if U is a contraction and C is a contraction, and C times U is the identity, what does that tell us about C and U? Neither one of them could shrink a vector, right? Because if one of them shrank the length of a vector, the other one would have to expand the length. So C and U are both isometries. Uh, so, in particular, this means U is an isometry because its, uh, its domain is the whole space. Thank you. So, that's the, uh, that's the second conclusion. <laughs> so, the, uh, the proposition that I'll use quite often is if I have a uh, positive semi-definite matrix, and <clears throat> I know its rank is R, and I have it written two ways. One uses the minimal number of vectors, and the other uses some <coughs> arbitrary number of vectors. Then there's this uh, unique U, which is uh, <coughs> M by R. It's an isometry, means that U star U is the identity, the R by R identity matrix. And now the uh, last thing I didn't really say is uh, what is this equation W star equals U times V star? What is that actually saying? And uh, let me draw a picture. <coughs> so W star is the matrix whose rows are W1 through WM. V star is the matrix whose rows are <coughs> V1 through VR star. And then you have this matrix uh, UIJ. So if you can picture the matrix multiplication, what happens in the ith row <coughs> <coughs> 
And now, if I just take uh, stars of both sides, this says that Wi So the W's are expressed as linear combinations of the U's. There's always this funny business that happens. It's one way you look at it, it's the U's. The other way you look at it, it's the U conjugates. But if you take a, an isometric matrix and you do complex conjugates of all the entries, it still satisfies this equation. So, so really, the U I'm using here is the U that has the complex conjugates for its entries. That's the only change in notation between the two. So the proposition is that there exists this isometric change of basis that allows you to express the Ws as combinations of the Vs. That's the first piece of the proposition. The uh, second piece, which I'll use often, is that the span of the Vs and the span of the Ws <coughs> has to be the same. And that also follows from the fact that this uh, U is an isometry. Okay. So, uh, so there's, the, there's the key observation I'm going to use. If you take a positive and you write it two different ways. You mean uh, dimension or just vector space they are same? Pardon? You mean dimension or the vector space? No. The span is the same. Because see, the, the Ws are all in the span of the Vs. No, okay. And also, if I use the... Uh, this equation, I'm expressing the Vs as linear combinations of the Ws. So the spans are actually the same. Uh, remember, all these vectors, because P is n by n, all these vectors are <coughs> n-tuples. So, that, so they're, they're both vectors in Cn, in this case. What are equal to the range of P? Yeah. yeah. And it's also equal to the range of P. <coughs> I won't need that fact very often, but good to point out. Okay. So uh, those of you who are experts in matrix theory, I hope you haven't all fallen asleep by this moment. But it's this, it's this relationship between uh, two different right ways to write a positive that uh, turns out to be crucial for uh, what uh, Choi is doing. So Choi knew these things so well, he didn't really mention them. And then he thought what he was doing was just such a trivial uh, extension of this thing he knew so well from, uh, he was a student of Chandler Davis, who's really the master of matrix theory. But Choi thought these other things were just such trivial uh, extensions of this fact that he never bothered to write them down as theorems. They were just little things he used, remarks, every now and then in the middle of proofs. And so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the thing I want to get to today. So uh, questions before I go on? Okay. So let me remind you of Choi's first theorem, the one that uh, Professor Pizier did in his talk. I just want to state it, and then I want to give you uh, a very quick uh, outline of uh, the way I would prove the theorem, because uh, if you see the way I would prove the theorem, uh, it'll make the, the next step uh, very easy. So the theorem I'll always refer to as uh, the first theorem of Choi. So this it appears in his uh, 75 paper. <coughs> we suppose we have uh, a map phi 
which takes the uh, matrices of size n to the matrices of size d. Of course, uh, all maps are linear. Then uh, the following are equivalent. And the first thing <coughs> is that phi is a completely positive map. Now, I, I thought I, do I need to say what completely positive is? Uh, or I think you probably heard that definition 12 times at least last week. Okay. The second is that phi is n positive. Still OK? So completely means for all n. This just means you do up to level n. The third thing is if you take the matrix units for the domain, of which there's n, and you apply phi to each of those, then where does this live? Well, there's each block inside is d by d. So the notation for that I'll use is it's mn of md. Right? So here, each phi of eij is a d by d matrix. And now I have uh, i and j run from 1 to n. So this is my notation for block matrices each block size is d by d, and I have n things. And that's positive. And then the fourth part is phi can be written as a sum So the equivalence of 1 and 4 was actually done by the math physicist Krauss. So this, uh, this is often called the Choi-Krauss representation. Uh, another math physicist uh, picked up on this idea and did lots of, uh, lots of work with it. So this is often called the choi Jam Leo Cow. Well, I'll scribble it anyways. Because I'll never remember how to spell Jam Leo Kowska. There's a, I don't remember if there's an S or an SZ uh, something. It's, uh, it's written down more carefully in my notes. Uh, this is often called the Choi Jam Leo Kowska matrix. So this was, uh, this was the, the lovely theorem that. Uh, Choi notice. So let me, let me remind you of the proof of it, because most of it is, is quite trivial. First off, if it's completely positive, it's obviously n positive. If it's n positive, well, if you look at the block matrix, the so-called matrix of matrix units, that's an n by n thing, which is positive. And so n positivity means that phi of it will be positive. So n positive implies that this is positive. Also, the easy side of the choi krauss is that if you do have something written this way, it's very easy to see that it is completely positive. So 4 implies 1 is also quite trivial. And all the work is this 3 implies 4. So let me remind you of the way that's done, and let me, uh, at least in my own notation. Because I think my notation is probably quite different from Pizier's proof of that implication. So I have this P phi. Well, if I just forget all the extra parentheses in these block matrices, that's really just an 
n times d by n times d matrix. And let's, uh, for definiteness, say that the rank of p phi is r. So I know I can always uh, decompose p phi as the sum of rank 1 tensors. Where, where do these vi's live now? Well, each vi is uh, an nd tuple. So what's the natural way to write an nd tuple? Well, things here are broken into blocks of size d. So let's do the same thing with the nd tuple. So I'll write it as an uh, a1, A2, and now the essence of choice proof is instead of thinking of this vector as a vector, he thinks of the vector as a matrix, where each of these pieces is representing the columns of the matrix. So he just lets AI be A1I. And what is this? This is a D by N matrix. And now the rest of it is you simply check that uh, And so this shows that, uh, that phi of each matrix unit is expressed as this sum. But then since phi is a, a linear map, if the linear map phi agrees with this linear map on all basis vectors, it agrees everywhere. And so that's what implies that phi of any matrix And so that's the, that's the little step that's the, uh, the heart of Choi's theorem. And there's just two things we really need, to, uh, really need to notice here. And the first thing is, If we took any other way to write uh, P phi, as a sum of vectors, Again, those uh, vectors are n uh, d tuples. 
And if we play the exact same trick, of taking that n d-tuple and splitting it into uh, n things which are each d-tuples. And then we took the uh, entry vectors and used that to build uh, a matrix. Again, this would be a D by N matrix. Then for all the same reasons, if we put the Bs here instead and we worked out what that was in terms of the vectors, it would just give us the phi of EIJs. So we'd also have phi written as a sum of BIX as BI stars. So there was, uh, there was nothing special here. It was just the, the way the matrix multiplication works, that when you do the ALs times the EIJs times the AL stars, what you're really doing is doing the sum of the uh, vectors that appear in a particular block. So, uh, so every time you take some way to decompose P phi as a sum of rank ones, it gives you a new Troy Krauss representation of the, uh, of the map phi. <coughs> But the third observation is the converse is also true. If I have any way like even numbers. Uh, so conversely, if I had some Troy Krauss representation of my map, and I took each of these matrices and I picked off its columns, So instead of thinking of, uh, thinking of it as a matrix, I thought of it as a very long column vector. <coughs> then when I sum up those column vectors, these are now dn tuples. So they're making a dn by dn matrix. And the matrix they make is P phi. <coughs> so, uh, so that's the that's the point I want to emphasize is that um, what Choi realized and didn't really state explicitly as a theorem ever is that all the different ways to express a completely positive map in a Troy Krauss representation, just via this little trick of uh, thinking of matrices as elongated vectors, takes you back and forth between it's just all the different ways to write uh, phi in Troy Krauss 
are the same as all the different ways to decompose a positive matrix as a sum of rank one tensors. Okay. So, uh, so that's the that's the bit that's uh, in Choi and never really stated very carefully, but it's what uh, what leads to most most of the uh, the later magic. Questions? Because I, I now I need to erase. Okay. So the, the next <coughs> next thing I need to discuss is <coughs> the idea of the Troy rank. So I have a phi which is completely positive between an MN and an MD. And so this implies that phi can be written as a sum and uh, the Choi rank of phi This is my symbol to mean uh, is defined to be equal to the uh, minimum of all such Qs such that uh, phi Think of all the possible ways you could express it, and now you find the minimal such way. I'll call this a proposition. I don't want to embarrass Troy by thinking he would ever call it a theorem. But I think you can all guess what it is. It's What is the minimum number you can use? It's exactly the rank of P phi. So I'll, I'll leave this one to fill in the details. But it's just using the magic of going back and forth, right? That uh, each time you express gives you an expression this way. So it's not too surprising that the minimal way you can do it is the minimal number of terms you need here, and the minimal number of terms you need here is exactly the spectral representation, which is the rank. So the Troy rank is just exactly equal to the rank of P phi. <coughs> so here's uh, Here's the next theorem. Suppose we have a <coughs> completely positive map R is the uh, Troy rank and I have phi written two different ways So two different Troy Krauss representations. <coughs> 
one of minimal length, one of any other length at all. The theorem is that uh, then there exists a unique matrix U of scalars. So in this case, it will be a M by <coughs> R matrix. U star U is just the identity matrix. And each BI is expressed as the sum of those combinations of the AJs. And the other thing we can add on to here <coughs> now these Bs all are uh, N by D matrices, or uh, sorry, D by N matrices. So this is uh, some subspace of the D by N matrices. And that subspace is always the same as the A1 through AR subspace. So it's, a, it's really remarkable when you think about it in terms of CP maps. You, you wouldn't expect there to have to be such a strong relationship between the matrices that occur in these two different representations. Uh, first off, it's not at all clear that the span should be the same. And then second off, the fact that you can rewrite the Bs in terms of the As, but when you do it, the coefficients you use always are an isometric matrix. All those things seem very, very remarkable. But the proof is uh, very elementary, because the As Under this identification of thinking of a, a matrix as a very long vector, the A's correspond to some vectors, the B's correspond to some vectors, and those vectors are just two different ways to decompose the Choi Jam Liukowska. And now we're just back to our theorem about two different ways to write a positive matrix as a sum of rank ones. And that theorem tells us that the Ws can be written as linear combinations of the Vs in such a way that the coefficients form a, a isometric matrix. But the only difference between the Ws and the Bs is just uh, how you're taking these numbers and stacking them. You can either stack them as really long vectors, or you can either stack them as matrices. So so we're back to the theorem about uh, decomposition of uh, P's into rank one positives. Okay. So that's the, that's the mathematical part that I, I wanted to uh, take us through. Are, th are there any questions on that? Okay, good. So what I'd like to do is give you a, a little introduction to uh, what people try to do in quantum error correction. Uh, before we do quantum error correction, it's often good to just think about the binary case for a moment. So 
So uh, classically, what would be going on is we have a string of zeros and ones. Just uh, to keep things uh, <clears throat> very definite, let's, uh, let's say they, there were five tuples I was trying to encode. So a typical string might be 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. <clears throat> we can always view this as being in Z2 to the fifth. Z2 is our binary field, and this is the five-dimensional vector space over that. And uh, we want to transmit this to uh, somewhere else. Well, stuff happens when you uh, try to transmit. They tried to transmit me, and I lost my voice. Uh, you try to transmit this vector, and some static might occur, which flips uh, some of the bits to other bits. So uh, static, or maybe uh, magnetism, could be uh, anything, uh, flips uh, some zeros to ones, and vice versa, ones to zeros. Incidentally, if you think about what that is, that's the external world acting on you, right? So this is something that's coming from the environment. So in quantum error correction, you often hear about the environment acting, and this is exactly the same thing. the environment acting on our vector. So the question is that plagues uh, engineers for years is how to detect and correct. Of course, this is a, a field with a very long history. Uh, I just want to tell you one small example. Yes. Since we are talking about mathematics right now, can you define mathematically the source of those errors as opposed to physical consideration? Is there a mathematical way to formulate this problem? Uh, I'm not going to try. Uh, I, I just want to give you uh, an intuitive background so that I can uh, use the intuition when I go to the quantum. I mean, mathematically, a vector is a vector. I mean, mathematically, what, what, yes. what would be the noise? So you can think of the noise, since we're doing arithmetic mod Z2, you can think of the noise as adding on an error vector. So when the error vector is all zeros, you've added on no noise. Uh, if, say, this zero is flipped to a 1, that's the same as the noise vector being the vector 1, comma, 0, 0, 0. So, so mathematically, you can just think of it as you send this vector and you receive this vector plus an error vector, where it's vector addition over the field C2. So you hope that the error vector is all zeros. Uh, but when it's not all zeros, you want some way to, uh, to try to fix that. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah. I don't know if that helps. Uh. Do you perhaps have some model like, for example, you have some random vector, and if that random vector happens to be the factor of one million, then you have a noise, and if it's anything else, then you don't? Yeah, well, often you assume that the errors are independent in each term and occur with some small probability p. So, so you can compute the 
for the error vectors, you can compute the probability of uh, uh, each possible error vector occurring when you make those kinds of assumptions. So those, those are the kinds of assumptions that are typically made when they try to uh, make a, a mathematical theory here. I, I'm just trying to give you some in, intuitive description for the moment. Okay. So, uh, so one way that people try to uh, fix this is they do what's called encoding the vector. So you, you start with your vector, which was originally a five-tuple. You first encode it as a much longer vector. And then uh, hopefully, uh, as that longer vector goes, uh, the errors that happen, uh, you can make up for them, because uh, it would take way more errors for you to miss things. So let me, let me show you a very simple example, because it's, uh, it's the example that motivates uh, one of the famous uh, quantum error correcting codes. Since I'm now uh, visiting the world's largest democracy, it might make sense to talk about the majority rule code. So here's the idea behind this one. You, you pick, a, you pick a, a value you're willing to use. Let's, uh, let's say uh, n equals 3 in our case. And I start with my original vector. <coughs> and the way I'll encode it is just every time I have a 0, I'll do that 0 three times. And then I'll do the 1 three times. I hope I left myself enough room. So there's my, there's my original five tuple. And this is the way that I encode. And then I would transmit that. And maybe a little bit of static happens. So what I receive. is this. And now the way I decode it is, well, the majority rules. So in the first block, the majority of entries are still zeros. So I assume that that's what was meant to be sent, was a zero. The second block, majority is uh, ones. Third block, uh, majority is zeros. Fourth block, majority is zeros. Fifth block, majority is ones. And there's the only place I made a mistake. Right. After I encode, transmit, and decode, I have uh, one error that happens. But it's very easy in this case to analyze uh, what does it take for that one error to happen. Well, within each block, there has to be at least two errors that occur for, you t for majority rule to make a mistake. So if you know the probability of each error occurring, and you make a natural assumption like errors occurring are independent, then you can compute uh, exactly the probability of a single block being decoded incorrectly or the overall vector as being decoded incorrectly. So with some, some moderate assumptions about probabilities, you can, uh, an independence, you can 
work out how effective this code is. And you can make a mathematical theory of how effective this uh, type of code would be. Okay. Any, any questions? Uh, yeah. It's the same as sending the single message three times. That's just a, a matter of how you, you know, I could encode it by tripling each thing or I could encode it by repeating three times. But then I still have to apply this majority rules. I look in the first slot and I see how many times I got a zero for the first slot. And if that's the majority, I keep the, keep the zero. The, the way you're describing it is actually slightly more effective because when you spread things out, the uh, static tends to happen in bursts. Uh, a a any other questions? I just want to use this to motivate uh, what comes later a little bit. The, the, uh, the key ideas are what causes errors are static. What static really is is that's the environment acting on the vector. The way we try to fix that is we have some rule by which we encode and some rule uh, after we transmit by which we decode. Okay. So what the rule does in our case, if I always choose the rules to be this kind of linear map, then if I look inside here, this is really a vector in a 15-dimensional space. But the possible encoded vectors, because this was originally five tuples, uh, the possible encoded vectors represent a five-dimensional subspace of my 15-dimensional space. The encoded vectors So I could sort of turn this uh, encoding, decoding on its head a little bit. And instead of thinking, trying to in invent a clever algorithm for encoding, what I could do instead is inside Z15, I could look for a clever five-dimensional subspace. So I just want to try to get the intuition across that having a, a clever encoding algorithm in a certain sense, uh, some people call this the Grassmannian viewpoint. I think that's a little bit of, of fancy language for something very simple. Is instead of thinking of a way to send Z5 into Z15, you just first pick a clever <coughs> subspace of Z15. And then once you have a clever subspace, you just find some linear embedding of your original space into it. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Why does it called Grassmannian? Does it have to do with Grassmann numbers? So it's yeah, like, has it has to do with, uh, in America, you get much better funding if you somehow make yourself sound like you're doing algebraic geometry. And uh, in algebraic geometry, they talk about Grassmanns a lot. So people doing coding theory, if they use algebraic geometry language, then the people on the funding panel will go, oh, yeah, that's really a good idea. So it just has to do with, uh, in algebraic geometry, instead of thinking of linear maps, they think of subspaces. And there's an equivalence between the linear map and the subspace. Right? It's, no, the, it's the, the closed. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about when you think of the graph of a linear map and you view that as a subspace, they sometimes call that the Grassmannian subspace because it makes them sound like they're doing algebraic geometry. Okay, that's that. I, it was intended as a joke and nothing more, really. But they do use that language. Uh, any, yeah? Is it all the kind of subspaces to be sort of equivalent when they exist at a level of here? Well, I'm just suggesting that that's another way you could view the problem. Instead of trying to think of an encoding, you could turn the problem a little bit uh, on its head and think of looking for a nice subspace. And then that, that nice subspace might be your way of encoding. Is it the embedding rather than the subspace? Pardon? Is it the embedding rather than the subspace? That well, usually you sort of 
make it a two-step process. You pick a clever subspace and you click, pick a good embedding to that clever subspace. Because uh, the, the code I want to do in quantum error, that, that's the way it's going to come about. Is first they pick the clever subspace and then they, uh, they use that to do the, the encoding. So I just wanted to do this for motivational background. That the, the two things are going on. You have, uh, you have an encoding. You have errors happening. That that's some kind of environmental operation. And you have a, a decoding, or the other word I'll use sometimes is this is recovery. You're trying to recover the original message from what you've received. Um, well, I'm viewing it as linear because I'm viewing it as uh, the vector just goes to the same vector, but meantime, there could be linearly added to it an error vector. Okay. So when you think of the errors, you can think of that as adding a vector to this vector. So you... <coughs> The models can be more and more complicated. I'm just trying for a little bit of uh, motivation. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. I'm supposed to end at 11.30, is that right? 11, okay, good. I, I feel better about my planning. So here's the, here's the theorems I'm going to uh, look at next time. So here's the, here's the idea. So we'll have, uh, we'll have CN. Inside, we'll have some subspace V. So sort of think of this as the, the clever subspace you're going to project onto. We have the orthogonal projection. And we have an E. We all know that uh, the evolution of a quantum system is uh, described by these completely positive uh, trace-preserving maps. And uh, here's the problem we'd like to do. Uh, so let's say our E is written as a summation of uh, EI X, EI star. And if you remember, the trait preserving condition is the same as saying that the EI star EIs add up to the identity. <coughs> and so what we would like to do, that if we have uh, psi, or let me call it V, since I've been using V, an element of this subspace. So I want to think of this as some uh, state. And I look at E. So this uh, state, remember, corresponds to a uh, rank one positive. That rank one positive is the thing I want to transmit, or the thing that I'd like uh, inside my quantum system to be left alone. So it's not going to be left alone, though, because the environment is going to act on it. And that's what this E is representing. So uh, this is what happens to my original state after I try to uh, let time go by. It's uh, it's not so good anymore. It's, uh, 
this E has happened to it. And what we, uh, we <coughs> seek something else that uh, will be our recovery to try to uh, recover our original state. So since everything has to be a quantum operation, it also is going to be CPTP. And uh, what we want is that R E So this is the kind of quantum error correction I want to discuss next time. So it looks very amateurish on one level because we're assuming that we know exactly what errors are going to occur. That's kind of amateurish. And all we're trying to do is recover those errors. And now this, uh, this V is what I'll refer to as my protected subspace. So in the sense back here, it's all the encoded messages that are the protected subspace. So what you'd like to do is you'd like to start with uh, maybe some arbitrary states, and you're going to take them and you're going to encode them into the protected subspace so that the states live there. And then for this protected subspace, you know you have a recovery operation. So as I say, it seems a bit amateurish, and I couldn't understand what they were up to at first with this. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're assuming you already know what the error is that's going to happen. That doesn't seem very good. And you're only going to protect against that one given error. But what makes it all so remarkable is choice theorems. We'll see that uh, any other error operator whose, whose E's are composed as linear combinations of these E's, this very same R will work for all of those. So you're not, so once you protect for a single assumed error, you're also protecting for a whole family of errors. So that's the theorems I want to do next time. And the reason that once you protect for a single error, you protect for a whole family, comes from those Choi theorems I did this time. So now my tale is done. Thank you very much.